Hi everyone. It's January 19th. No, it's January 16th. <laughs> I'm thinking about the coming lunar eclipse. But last week at the top of my Earth Files YouTube channel news updates, I reported that the January 9th early morning that I had received a phone call from a man who lived in New Jersey and he had heard from his daughter, who is a high school art teacher, and that she had been driving in Freehold, New Jersey, when she saw this large, white, perfect circle, she thought, bluish, white, glowing object coming down toward Route 179, and it seemed to dive suddenly at a 90 degree angle right down into the trees, and she saw no tail, she didn't hear any sound like uh, you would expect a tail from a bolide, and sometimes you'd even hear a sound. And she was alarmed at how big it was, and it seemed so close to her that she was afraid there was going to be an explosion. And she and her dad contacted me because they asked, could this be a real UFO? And then by January 12th, I was sent several reports one specifically from Signs of the Times headlined, quote, hundreds report seeing bright meteor fireball over the east coast of the United States. And this photograph was distributed by the American Meteor Society along with a videotape describing how hundreds of witnesses ranging from New York and New Jersey to Pennsylvania, Virginia, and North Carolina called various authorities about seeing a bright white ball of light falling from the sky between 6.35 and 6.45 a.m. East Coast time on Wednesday, that early morning of January 9th, the same as the art teacher. Then, strangely, some residents of North Carolina and Virginia reported that hours earlier at 11.40 p.m. on Tuesday night, January 8th, they saw a red fireball with a glowing white tail coming down in those states. That means that there were two brilliant fireball events, one Tuesday night before midnight and then Wednesday morning near 6.30 a.m. on the East Coast. By today, January 16th, 2019, a week later, the American Meteor Society has received over 450 reports about a fireball seen at the 6.30 a.m. Uh, timeline on the East Coast on January 9th in Connecticut, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, Mississippi, and North and South Carolina. But the story doesn't end there. NBC TV Channel 4 in New York has now interviewed two sisters that were walking along the Tom River in New Jersey when they found a crater in the beach sand with black rocks in the bottom of the crater. Jean Mechanic said, quote, this thing was perfect as if something had hit there and blasted this out, close quote. And this is one of her Facebook photos. In another of their Facebook photos, it shows one of the dark black rocks partially buried in the center bottom of the crater they estimated was five feet wide and two feet deep. Jean Mechanic told NBC4 that she thought at least the large black rock down in the center of the sand crater was maybe the January 9th meteorite that everyone seemed to have seen and that it had crashed into the beach along Tom's River in New Jersey. That was the direction that the large circular white glowing object was falling and when it was seen and reported by the high school art teacher near Freehold, New Jersey. Here is a map that shows the relationship of New York City where there were eyewitnesses and then down to Freehold, New Jersey where the high school art teacher was and then on to Tom's River, New Jersey on the beach. But as logical as all of this seems, when Stockton University physics professor Joe Trout was interviewed by New York's WNBC-TV about these rocks that Jean Mechanic and her sister found in the sand crater at Toms River, Professor Trout said 
that the dark rocks were more like chunks of coal that were smoothed out by erosion in the ocean and not at all dense and heavy as meteorites usually are. And so Professor Trout questions whether the sand crater and rocks have anything at all to do with the large glowing white object early Wednesday morning, January 9th, or the large bright red bolide seen with a long tail on Tuesday night, several hours before uh, the morning event. Whatever happened around those two bright bolides last Tuesday and Wednesday, another astronomical event is upcoming this weekend, which if there's clear weather, this should be gorgeous. Our Earth moon will begin entering the Earth's penumbra shadow in this New Year's first full moon at 10.33 p.m. Eastern, which is 7.33 p.m. Pacific on Sunday evening, January 20th, 2019. This map shows that all of North and South America, wherever the skies are clear, will be able to see this 2019 total lunar eclipse. And the first shadow will appear dusky gray at first, but as more of the full moon sinks into the Earth's shadow, it should take on a distinctly orange color. The orange comes from sunlight refracted and scattered through Earth's atmosphere, and that eerie haunting color of deep orange should be most intense during totality, which lasts from 11.41 p.m to 12.43 a.m. Eastern, that's crossing from January 20th into early uh, January 21st for East Coasters, right after midnight. And that will be 8.41 p.m. to 9.43 p.m. Pacific and all of the time zones in between. The eclipse map shows that everyone in North America to South America will be able to watch the entire lunar eclipse wherever there are clear skies. It is called a super blood wolf moon because this full moon will look about 10% bigger than it usually does. These super moons happen because the moon's orbit is an ellipse. It's not a perfect circle. Its distance from Earth can vary by about 10% as it travels around in its elliptical orbit. Further, this is the first full moon of the new year of 2019. In olden times, some people have called the New Year's first full moon a wolf moon. According to the Old Farmer's Almanac, full moon names have come from the Algonquin North Americans. The Algonquins thought that the naming of each full moon in each year cycle would give the intent of the name the active energy to each month. And beyond wolf, the word blood refers to the deep red-orange color that total lunar eclipses can become. The next total lunar eclipse visible from the United States won't happen until May 26, 2021. And that one will only be visible from the West Coast and Hawaii. Early risers on the West Coast will be able to see that, 20, uh, that uh, 2021 eclipse moon just before dawn as it sets on the Western horizon. Now, tonight, I would like to share also a discovery that I recently made in my ongoing research and investigations concerning the question, what is the truth? about American secret space programs and secret astronauts. It is true that the United States Air Force secretly developed a spy program called Manned Orbiting or Orbital Laboratory, also known as MOL, pronounced mole or mall, depending upon which part of the country you come from. After several years of highly secret development, Mole was first announced to the American public on December 10th, 1963, and it was a creation by the United States Air Force who was collaborating behind the mole scenes with the highly classified National Reconnaissance Office known as the NRO. It was officially established on September 6, 1961 
but the NRO was kept secret as possible for the next 30 years until its official declassification on September 18, 1992. The Mole Defense Contractor was Douglas Aircraft Company, and the goal was to use secret U.S. Air Force astronauts to spy on the Earth from an orbiting satellite that was monitored by the NRO. So there were secret astronauts in secret spacesuits that worked for Mole, and it was only recently, in July of 2015, that in response to a FOIA request by Ben Wright McGee, who produces AstroWright.com, that the highly secret National Reconnaissance Office declassified more than 20,000 pages concerning the secret mole program, and it had images. Now, some of the documents are about a mole-related program called SAINT, S-A-I-N-T, all caps, a U.S. Air Force military space program along with Blue Gemini, which produced the vehicle used to get to and from the orbiting spy reconnaissance craft called MAL. FOIA revelations about NRO satellite inspector program same. Here is a section from a June 1966 NRO document archived in the U.S. Air Force Historical Division Liaison Office entitled, quote, The Air Force in Space, Fiscal Year 1962, identified SAINT as an acronym for Satellite Inspector. From page 93, Satellite Inspector states, quote, For several years prior to fiscal year 1962, the U.S. Air Force had studied a proposed Satellite Inspector SAINT system, which would examine unidentified objects in space and determine their characteristics, capabilities, or intent. Further, the very last paragraph of one of the documents, and you can see all of this at my news website, earthfiles.com. It's in a, a report now at the top. It's uh, classified under science and freely uh, available to everybody in the world. No subscription needed. And for you to be able to study these documents would be so important because it is amazing what I'm learning about our past space history. And in one of these documents entitled History of the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, it says, quote, on his return to the Pentagon, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense from 1961 to 1968, asked Secretary Eugene Zuckert, Secretary of the U.S. Air Force, to review U.S. Air Force space projects to determine their applicability to the following four missions. One, inspection and destruction of hostile satellites. You could say today that that was a code word for UFOs and it would be covered as that an enemy satellite might be the Soviets. But inspection and destruction of hostile satellites, protection of U.S. satellites from destruction by whatever these hostile satellites are, space reconnaissance and use of near-Earth orbit effective weapons. So that means that at the early 1960s that our government was already aware of what their own now FOIA release documents declared were unknown satellites or unknown objects that could fall into this category of hostile satellites. And Last night, I was on Jimmy Church's Fade to Black, and we were talking about many, many subjects, including all of what is beginning to emerge the, de the deeper we dig into what was behind the scenes of NASA uh, back to the uh, 1950s to the 1960s, and that it is very clear that NASA covered up a tremendous amount of secret projects that were going on behind the scenes. And we talked about that last night. We talked about uh, Robert, uh, 
Lazar, we talked about J. Allen Hynek, and a lot of first-hand personal conversations and experiences that I have had. And it was a wonderful radio broadcast, and we had some kind of a social media problem that the alert didn't go out to you guys, uh, who are the, this wonderful audience on my Wednesday YouTube channel, and I would love for you to have seen and heard uh, Jimmy does a video and audio last night. And he sent me today uh, saying that if you all tonight, later on, uh, after we get off the air or tomorrow or whenever, because now it's archived, if you would like to see this uh, very, very uh, interesting uh, discussion that Jimmy Church and I had last night, he has this... Uh, uh, there are hot URLs, and I'm going to put some up at earthfiles.com and just tell you tonight that if you go to Fade to Black and you click on the youtube.com watch link, that you can get directly to that YouTube broadcast last night that so many people emailed me about the day, and, and I was sorry to hear we had a computer glitch of some sort, and then the message didn't get out to you. And I will also put up some of these links so that you can get there. Now, before I go to my favorite part of Wednesday YouTube channel, which is to hear your questions, I'm going to just start tonight. Something I'm going to begin to unfold over all the Wednesdays is to select some of the many amazing letters that I'm getting by email and handwritten when we go into subjects and then so many of you are writing to me and saying you have not known who to reach out to and you are coming to my Earth Files YouTube channel and you are finding comfort in what it is that I'm sharing with you all and that now so many of you are sending me some of your experiences which you have not shared with anybody. And tonight, I'm picking one from a man in Greece who was born and raised in England. And over the next uh, month or two, eventually I'm going to have edited part of our interview because he has had extraordinary experiences with what would fall into the category of something not human, but not clearly extraterrestrial. And this is one of those areas of, are we dealing with other dimensions? Are we dealing with time travelers? Are we in a holographic universe that's being projected and those that project come to some of us? And that's why it is so strange that people can't figure out what it is that's dealing with them and what is downloading and using their own thoughts. And that's the category of this man in Greece today. He lives on Corfu. And he says about six years ago, that would be 2013, and he's 61 years old now, uh, and he's had a life that has been punctuated by high strangeness. But this is now uh, more recent in his life, which makes this very interesting. He said, about six years ago, I was diagnosed with cerebral, cerebral vasculitis, and he suffered blackouts and seizures. And he was in the process of having medical help to try to prevent this, and he was in the kitchen, and he collapsed in one of these seizures. He says, quote, during this seizure, I was extremely unwell. I can remember having this vivid recollection of the past. And I must have been unconscious because my partner was trying to get the phone number to call the medical services and my dog was pushing my head with his nose. And I am seeing all of this happening from outside myself. So now he's in and out of body up above looking down. He said, I felt a tearing sensation, as if Velcro were being torn apart 
in my body. And then he's somewhere else. He says, I was somewhere else. I had what I can only describe as a download of information that I had been given in the distant past. And then I can clearly remember being a child that I stood next to three beings, but I cannot see their faces. He described to me that uh, it was like looking through light, but that his empathic self, uh, the soul part, knew that there were three consciousnesses uh, behind and in these lights that were putting this information into his head. And he said, I can re clearly remember that I was seeing myself as a child and I knew it was these three beings, even though I can't see their faces. And they are communicating telepathically. And he said, quote, this really freaks me out. It was explaining to me that I was too young to understand in the beginning what was happening to me. And that what they were trying to communicate had to do with multi-dimensional issues. And that eventually I would come to understand that I was chosen because I was an empath, a trait that I had inherited from them. He identifies himself through what they told him, that he is genetically linked to them. And he said that they telepath humans were dangerous beings, but that it was never meant to be that way. That quote, the soul as we know it was an accidental side effect of their genetic engineering on earth that created uh, the standing up primates of which we are now a current model. A theme that has come through so many documents and so many communications with people who have worked in counter intel and intel in the military. And that one day that he would know when the time was right to talk and that he would then be sharing what they told him about humans, about our lives, our religions, our souls, who made us and why they are so interested in us. And he said, I have been left with a foreboding feeling that the human race is tangibly close to an impasse in our existence. We have been so dumbed down by government, media, the internet and social media that we are almost immune, if not brainwashed about life and the meaning of it. And this truly scares me as I feel we are as a race being corralled into following an agenda that is not of our own free will. I cannot even explain, Linda, how I found your video, but I knew, having watched it as if I were guided to it, that so much of what you spoke about has resonated deeply within me and I was almost destined to make contact. I have had several people say those kind of words and what I'm hoping is that as you and I share each week, and as I select, this was just a beginning to let you know the subjects that will be covered as we go into the future, because what I would like to do is to go in depth in, with what he has been exposed to by these consciousness in the, consciousnesses in the light, and then break them out with other people who are writing similar or different, and then start uh, taking your voices and juxtaposing them, and maybe all together, us communicating together, we will begin in my Earth Files YouTube channel to start seeing a bigger picture woven from all of the experiences that you have had and have never talked about before, and that I, as an investigator for the last 40 years, have talked with a lot of people, and I might be able to add 
some insight and context. But what I am finding that I'm hearing is this repetition of feelings about the fact that wherever our source was in terms of genetic manipulation, we are a surprise to it. And very often, what is defined as the surprise in humanity is our soul. And that we have talked about that before, and I think that other letters that I am now going to start weaving and juxtaposing so we will have a kind of coherent uh, look at what a lot of you are writing, that you will see how many other people have had experiences out of body or the passing of a relative in which they have had communication and that more and more of the letters coming to me are from people who are feeling that for the first time in their lives that they have a place that they can go or files YouTube channel and trust that they can talk to me completely and totally confidentially. I will never ever share names or locations unless you give me written or verbal permission. And in this way, we'll be able to benefit from all of these voices that are coming and for those who can be made public by their giving me permission, we will start excerpting audio. I'm going to be uh, using audio that will be in uh, Coast to Coast and here at uh, the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, we will start adding in this new system that we're working on where we could do an excerpt from audio and then be able to open it up to questions to all of you. And I want to thank every one of you. Uh, I now have several hundred correspondences in these many subjects, from out of body to soul to what happens at the moment of death, UFOs, extraterrestrial biological entities, other dimensions, other timelines. And I want to thank you because as I read all of your personal experiences and I see the resonances with the four books I have already done and I'm trying to work on another, the documentaries that I have done, the work that I have done in Ancient Aliens and so many other television and radio projects. Everything is beginning to resonate as if we are in the presence of a real truth. If we can keep sharing with each other and you keep giving me your experiences and feedback, that maybe we are going to begin to see more of whole truths and not just the splinters that are left in the residues of minds that are, ha, have been subjected to confusion and not knowing what they were dealing with. And that is exciting for me. And if all of you feel that, then we'll gather here on Wednesdays. I will never know what is going to happen from Wednesday to Wednesday, but we will have a goal to have this dialogue. And with that heartfelt thanks from me, Lori. I would look forward to questions tonight. Well, first we have a few comments that I think you'd be interested in. All right. Number one is that the audience loves the music in the beginning. They appreciate having a oh, few seconds to good. jump on to chat. Good. And, 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 and my uh, City of Cyborgs, that is, uh, as I've said to you, that is like if I have a mantra of down with entropy, up with light, City of Cyborgs is sort of like the music that I love so much. And the next question that's not very serious is, how are Linda's beautiful fur babies doing? <laughs> uh, they are fantastic. Uh, they have been very rambunctious and playing today with balls and full of energy. And uh, Brad and I were working right up to when we went live tonight, which is why I said if I 
try to go get the cats will never be broadcast on time uh, because there has been so uh, many breaking things. And on top of everything, uh, we had to uh, had the problem of a battery. And it is so interesting in these efforts of production and bringing you information that we are always scrambling, trying to make sure that everything is working. And tonight we even had to get a small battery uh, to bring this to you. And, uh, and that's why at the last minute, uh, I think Fluffy knocked over something downstairs and Chocolate came running uh, to get something and then ran downstairs. And that's where they are tonight and I'm with you. And the next question is, are you working on another book? I'm trying. Uh, I'm trying to, I talked about this a little bit uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm trying to take this complex life that I have had uh, that has so many parts to it. And when I have filled up a notebook, which I have, with the things that have I just Rorschacked uh, without any editing that have been so important to me, it fills an entire uh, one-inch binder. And what I realize is to flesh all of that out, that I have got to find a way to take the themes of some things that have happened and decide what it is that my autobiography should talk about that has been the most important to me. And originally, it's fascinating. It's actually been in the process of doing this Earth Files YouTube channel. I never felt free, not ever, in my entire life. Until we started doing this Earth Files YouTube channel, I never really felt free to talk about things like some of the personal experiences and insights having to do with the passing of my parents or the big UFO I have seen that I shared with you. Uh, and there's many more really highly strange things that I've still not talked about. And there has been something about this dynamic of getting your cards, your letters, your emails, and realizing that where I was protecting my own inner self, but also I have had a career where I've had to be so careful and to protect people because I have been dealing for at least 40 years with extremely difficult subjects. A lot of them at various times, possibly life-threatening to me or to other people. And when you live that way and you know that your phone is tapped and you're followed and all you are is a humble reporter trying to understand what the truth is about non-human life interacting with our planet, our solar system, and what else is out in the universe. That's all I want to know. I want to know the truth. And that that is somehow threatening to the government of the United States has always shocked me. But in the shock, I have to deal with the reality. In dealing with the reality, I have to think about protection. In the protection, I'm always keeping secrets. I've always been keeping secrets. And I think that why I'm feeling this freedom in doing this Earth Files YouTube channel is the letters and the communications that you all have been giving me, you've been keeping secrets too. And that if this planet is going to evolve, if we're going to survive, it seems to me, we the people in nations with governments and the controllers of money, if we can't all move to a completely different plane where we can be honest about the most profound subjects 
in print, in broadcast, in conferences, in schools, in churches, then eventually the spark of excitement in being alive and exploring, it will die out because then you're left with a totalitarian planet, a police state, and I can't imagine any soul anywhere and any universe that would choose that. So this feels like a really special time. And that if you, on the other side of that lens, no matter what country you're in, and me in Albuquerque, New Mexico, struggling to try to understand what the facts and the truth are and report them, report them in any way I can, maybe we are going to end up like a pod and there will be other pods where we are at least trying to deal with each other honestly. And that in that honesty, I can meet and see you at Contact in the Desert or Alien Con or Conscious Life Expo or any of the conferences. I'm going to be speaking in Manchester, England in July. And I'm looking so forward to it because I know that from the last time I spoke there, so many young people and they are so far past government suppression and they are so uh, eager to know the truth like I am and they ask such good questions and that I know underneath the people that I met in Manchester two years ago there probably are thousands of experiences and that there is a feeling of inertia in the power of us being able to exchange and that is what I hope that we will continue to be able to do and that I would like your feedback on whether you like this uh, mix. I, as a longtime investigative reporter, I like to be able to come with you with some interesting news and some images at the top because um, who knows, the day will come when it is, ladies and gentlemen, we finally got it. We're not alone in the universe. Headlines all around the world and it will be a whole new day. All boats rise when that headline is public. What will happen to the scientists? What will happen to the doctors? What will happen to the leaders of nations? What will happen to you and to me who have been struggling for so long to understand the truth? And that is maybe why this feels like we're getting ready to burst that open and that I would love to hear from you all if you feel like these kinds of dialogues are helpful now before that revolutionary headline we're not alone in the universe is finally official and do you feel that you can help your families your friends your loved ones other people wherever you live because of what we're in dialogue at the earth files youtube channel i would really like to know if you think these kinds of content discussions are helpful to you and could be helpful to everybody on the planet if we can get to that headline, we're not alone in the universe. So I welcome your emails, your letters, uh, and we'll just keep going forward with the idea that this is helping people. And Laurie, uh, another question. You got it. So here's the next question. What do you think is the origin of the information that the Van Allen belt is impenetrable? Well, I don't have a, a single data point uh, that's based on fact to answer that question. I know about the Van Allen belt. I think I understand your question. Uh, maybe what would be good is um, that I do some research on the Van Allen belt and do a, a news piece on Earth Files YouTube. And that there are several things that are coming up having to do with why is the magnetic field, the north magnetic field of our planet moving so rapidly and accelerating to the point that we're now having to uh, have a 
uh, change in all of the data for uh, global positioning systems of some sort, that the magnetic fields of Earth, the Van Allen belts are part of that system, the magnetic fields are generated by the turning core at the center of our planet, and that there is a projection that this year of 2019 going forward, we may have more seismic events because of what is happening with the core. So all of these are kind of related. And I think maybe this is the time. I'll, I'll get into, I'll dig into relationships, Van Allen belt, what, what are the facts about it really? What's happening with that magnetic North Pole that is moving so quickly? Uh, what is happening in the core and the magna, magnum in our magma in our Earth that might make this a much more tumultuous seismic year? And we'll do a, a, a session in which I concentrate on that and then take your questions. So that'll be coming up in the future. I'll do that. Another question. All right. You bet. The next question is, hey, Linda, what about the Nixon time capsule? Whatever happens? Well, it is a very good question. And I have had more correspondence with uh, Caddy, the attorney, and others uh, who would like to see if there is some way to go further uh, with the White House archive people because you would think just out of curiosity that the White House archivists, that they would want to take merits, go behind X or wherever it is and just see if Richard M. Nixon's letter is there. That's all they're asking for. And to date, uh, it hasn't happened yet. So that's another one of those subjects that uh, we need to follow up, Daniel Liss and I, and uh, Attorney Caddy, and Robert Merritt. It is puzzling. It is almost as if the non-action at the White House end of things is almost like they know something that the rest of us don't, and that's why they have refused to do anything on this. Another question. So here's our next question. Could Linda address 5G? It's being deployed and is, as we knew it would, causing illness and death. Is there anything we can do? Uh, under one of my stacks on my desk, is exactly that. What are the biological consequences, the mental consequences of 5G? And I have uh, been hearing mixed signals, but I frankly think that uh, very, very credible people are extremely concerned about what the 5G explosion on this planet is going to do because it's going to be a lot of uh, frequencies that are going to be interacting with the human brain and the human body. And so that is one that uh, I plan to do. In fact, I wanted to uh, have a list of scientists and do something for Coast, for Earth Files, for the YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, perhaps one of my upcoming presentations in a conference, I may devote to this. So thank you for the question. It's on my mind as well. And Our next, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I have plenty more, Linda. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Is it the intent of China to share data with the world that they gather from their exploration of the moon during their current mission? What is their purpose for their mission? Well, one of them was to see if uh, that plant um, would, I think it was a cotton plant, would grow. And we got to see, it wasn't very clear, but we got to see the, the little green plant, you know, and it came up and it was kind of bent over. And then this morning, a day later, it really actually 
it just hit my heart. The plant died. The plant died, it, it was growing and then it died so fast. And I think that they are speculating that it might have to do with very, very cold temperatures that they were not able to control for that or generate. But I read something today that it may be uh, the temperature. But I, look at on the, you know, that this is another one of those, the glass is half full or half empty. The good part is that a seedling came up, was green, and looked like it was going to grow, even if it died a day later. So uh, we're on the threshold of so many frontiers. We have been denied knowledge about the secret space program as a civilization. But now with China, India is, I think, going to go, J Japan, I think every, there's going to be a lot of landings. Uh, the United States uh, wants to have now a permanent lunar base. So we're going to be in a new frontier where we, if you have five or six countries with bases, that means you have population support. That means that they're going to be able to do more and more complex long-term science, and we will be learning more and more about the conditions of learning on, uh, and living, learning and living on something like the moon, while uh, Elon Musk, if he stays on his last statement, he wants to launch for Mars uh, in a couple of years. I don't know if that timeline is realistic, but with all of these new frontiers that will be the focus of uh, different human groups from different nations, this could be one of the most exciting leverage points to get the world finally out of tribal warfare. Because if we're going to be on the moon together, we will be dependent upon each other in probably many ways, even if there are spies and counter intel and all of that going on, humans at their best are always uh, the best when they collaborate and are helping. And as we move out into space, I think that's going to become more and more important. What other tests? If that uh, rover, this is a fascinating uh, challenge, was the moon a natural explosion out of something that caused the asteroid belt, one of the hypotheses, and it flung into where the Earth was and maybe hit the Earth, and, uh, and then the remnant ended up being the moon? Okay, that's what you hear at, uh, at science conferences. Switch the needle over to the human abduction syndrome. I think going back as far as my doing a strange harvest on animal mutilations in 79 to 80 and beginning to meet people in the human abduction syndrome and starting doing so many interviews, that one of the common threads for a period of time, I have no idea why, there were many people in the abduction syndrome who would say, I was shown, or the words were in my head, that our moon is a machine, that it's hollow, it contains computer equipment, it can be driven, and that it was placed by a very advanced intelligence that has been monitoring, interacting with, and harvesting from this solar system for millions of years, that that civilization put this moon machine where it is and that the eclipsing of the sun, the eclipsing of the moon, that these were all parts of patterns that they wanted this moon to do so that the surface life that the non-humans have been experimenting with and harvesting from and manipulating DNA and already evolving primates 
to create standing up intelligences on this planet, that there would be something about the awe and the cycles of eclipses themselves that was somehow important for the non-humans to establish this relationship, astronomical relationship, between the evolving standing up primates and these astronomical events. This is coming from people in the human abductions. And it, it seems to me that we have to at least consider what they say. The pure physics might be right, this might be right, and that we are now, uh, and this leads to what uh, Cheng Yi, the Chinese, they're going to have the rover look, try to look for where there are protrusions of what was magma in the moon and it spilled out so much on the facing side toward Earth. The back side of the moon, there's only a couple of spots where it appeared that magma came up and flowed and not very big. Why was or were the magma flows on the earth facing side? And why was the backside, which doesn't rotate around so we see it, why is it so pockmarked with craters but no lava flows there? And this is one of the questions that the Chinese scientists are hoping that they could get some insight to. If the rover can identify some of the rocks where they are in the South Pole as being part of the, these magma upthrusts because the crater that they're in, the von Karman crater, it was created by something that just slammed into the moon. Huge force. And the speculation is that the crater where Chang'e is probably has some of the inside magma that was upthrust and if they could get a sample from it, they might learn something having to do with the difference between the moon and the earth or similarities. And, you know, as I say these words, it's like we're on the brink of where science once again could be the leveler, the inspirer, the one that starts getting more truth to us after 70 years of so much compartmentalization and policies of lies and denial. And that now with other nations going to the moon and hopefully we're gonna be going to Mars, science once again, without perhaps compartmentalization, that they will be doing real science in a new frontier and we will be learning facts, and then that will be contributing maybe to the real story of where did our moon come from? What did happen in the northern hemisphere of Mars? Who are we, really? And what is the relationship of our planet and our solar system to at least three competing geopolitical territorial fighting civilizations that have been interacting with our planet, mixing and matching genes and harvesting metals and things that were valuable to them from this planet for millions of years. I'm excited by that. I'm not afraid of it. If you and so many other people on the planet will express to their governments we are excited about learning the truth. We're not afraid of it. Maybe then they could start being more honest with the populations that they allegedly govern, afraid that we will collapse and that everything will self-destruct. If they simply tell us the truth, that we're not alone in this universe. And on that tonight, I'm going to say so long until next Wednesday, and I'll have one of the cats back, if not both. And hopefully we can start this facet 
of news and opening up some of your letters and getting into some of the subjects that you raise, like I will get into the Van Allen belt and the magnetic field moving so fast and what's happening in the core. Uh, I'll try to do that next week or the week after. And we will continue our flowing river of questions about everything and talking about everything as we move into 2019. Thanks.